design. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, the um, first part is on current situation, um, and the next slide um, shows a table which kind of has details of, of some of the work that's looked at the, 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 the scale and prevalence of the problem. And it can make some fairly depressive reading if you're starting out on a trial. Um, as you can see down the findings side, in relation to a wide range of trials in a wide range of contexts, um, problems with recruitment are so prevalent. Um, and the, the, the kind of latest UK study by Sully et al, looking at UK MRC and HTA trials, so the biggest trials with the most um, generous funding in some ways, 45% of those did not reach target. So these problems are absolutely common um, and they are across all types of trials and they bedevil the entire enterprise. So this is a really, really important piece of work um, to consider. Um, and it continues to bedevil researchers who've been in this area for a long time. So the um, paper I'm showing there is a, a paper looking at the, the methodological priorities of uh, people working in trials units. Um, and recruitment and retention um, were two of the top three priorities. So these are people at the sharp end who do this stuff all the time, and they want more research in this area because they continue to struggle. So why do we struggle? Um, there's lots and lots of potential reasons for this. This was a survey um, looking at uh, barriers of facilitators to recruitment. And the, they categorized the main areas. And as you can see, 60 or more factors identified. Trial, the type of trial, and we'll discuss that in a little bit of detail. Um, issues to do with particular sites you're working at, the, app, the, the participants and the population you're trying to draw from, the team that's trying to recruit the, trial, the, the participants themselves, the way the information is, is, is um, used and, and, and consent gained, and aspects to do with the study team, the research team, if you like, how experienced they are and how good they are at communicating with others and uh, within themselves. But what we actually know in terms of what drives poor and uh, good recruitment is very, very limited. So this was a study done by McDonald, again, looking at MRC and HTA trials. And all they found was that the, the only key drivers of recruitment were, were the intervention, is it available inside the trial only? Um, which is obviously an inducement for patients to take part. Was there a dedicated trial manager and the type of trial? So cancer trials and drug trials have better recruitment. So that's kind of useful, but not if you've got a particular type of trial, which doesn't happen to be one of those. Um, so we've got very little idea about what's driving the problems, but we know it's a big problem. And we've really got to think of solutions to this um, if we are going to make the trials enterprise a successful one. So moving on. Broadly, the consequences next. So what's the problem with poor trial recruitment? Broadly speaking, there are two major consequences, the scientific one and the logistical one. Uh, so in scientific terms, if you fail to recruit, you potentially will have an underpowered trial, which obviously has implications for the internal validity of that trial. And there's also the other the recognized issue of poor external validity. So if you're recruiting 5% of the patients who um, are eligible, that may also lead to uh, significant doubts about your ability to generalize from that population to the patient population that you're interested in. Then there's the logistic aspects. Um, trials that overrun lead costly extensions or get discontinued. And at worst, we end up with no evidence to support our decisions about patient care and it feeds into this entire concern now about research waste that research money is a precious resource and if we're wasting it on trials that don't recruit we are spending a lot of money for very little benefit and at some point somebody in government's going to wonder what that money is being used for and whether there's a better use for it so solutions next what do we know about this and what can we do about it this does in some ways make slightly depressing reading. So in terms of recruitment, there is um, obviously the best place to go is generally a systematic review. The Cochrane Review is a great place for that. There is a systematic review on um, recruitment to randomized trials by Sean Truick and colleagues. So that's really worth looking at. The main issue with that is that it's very, very limited. There, it's also published in the BMJ Open paper. Um, there are 45 studies in that but 19 of them are hypothetical. So it's asking people about what they would do in a situation. 
Um, and so it's a very, very limited evidence base, given the hundreds of thousands of trials that exist um, in the literature. We know relatively little about this. Sean has identified three major interventions which may have an effect. So telephone reminders to patients about recruitment. Um, Opt-out, where you um, essentially recruit patients um, using methods where they have to opt out if they don't want to be contacted. And an open design, where you, you're very clear about what the treatments are. Um, so this is useful to a degree, but of course there's ethical restrictions on um, telephone reminders. Some ethics committees don't like that. And your design may not fit either an opt-out design or an open design. Um, so that's a relatively limited benefit. Other effects that might be interesting, financial incentives. Uh, there is a developing literature on financial incentives in trials, and there is a trial showing that that is potentially uh, something that could improve recruitment. An SMS messaging to participants um, to improve recruitment. Again, that looks promising, limited evidence, and it may not be relevant for your trial. Um, that may have only impacts in certain situations. Retention. Retention in some ways gets a hell of a lot less attention than uh, recruitment because the focus is always on the recruitment, getting patients into a trial, and in a sense, retention becomes an afterthought. However, it is very important um, and it um, really is an area that I think needs more research because we know very little about it and there's real potential impacts. And there's concern, of course, that if we maximize re recruitment, we'll end up um, suffering in terms of retention will bring in patients who don't necessarily want to be in trials who may be ambivalent and then they'll drop out and we may end up just delaying a problem rather than solving it. So trials often adjust the sample size to um, take account of anticipated attrition but that's just really about power um, and retention can have much broader effects than that. If dropout differs between trial arms, if people drop out because they've had the treatment or because they've not had the treatment, that can cause significant problems. Um, and we may find that participants who don't have data and have left the trial are different from those who stay in. So there's real scientific issues around that. You can't deal with that just by bumping up the sample size um, to, to account for it. That's a, a only a partial solution. Now, again, there is a Cochrane review by Valerie, Valerie Bruton and her team uh, looking at this. Um, and again, very similar um, messages, limited evidence base, 38 trials, six types of strategies, including things like incentives and so on. So giving monetary incentives is potentially effective. Um, shorter questionnaires is potentially effective. There are some single trials looking at a variety of strategies which suggest some potential benefit but needs more research. And there's 10 or so other trials looking at other interventions, enhanced letters, behavioral strategies, which don't provide evidence of big effects. Now, the real limitation with this is this is largely about survey response, not other forms. So if you want to bring patients into your site to do a face-to-face -face assessment, this evidence isn't very relevant. So there's much less about that, and it's a real area of concern. And there is research, or at least grant bids, going in um, around this area. So hopefully in a few years we'll know much more. So from that, I hope at least you've taken that it's a major problem, and we know next to nothing about how to deal with it in terms of the scientific evidence. So we really now are in a position where all we can do is plan our studies most effectively to ameliorate these problems while we're waiting for the evidence base to develop. So this is one key planning tool for trials, Lasagna's Law. In clinical research, the prevalence of any disease falls to about 10% of what you thought it was the day you start to look for cases in your study. Some of you may have experience of this. I have personally been out to doctors who have told me, you will get your trial participants from my practice alone. They think there's so many patients out there, but it is there is a certain truth to that. Patients do tend to dry up. No matter the prevalence, the prevalence published in the literature, whatever you've seen on records, there is a big, big drop off. So you need to plan for that. Do not make optimistic assumptions about recruitment because they will come back to haunt you. So you need to think about the what this slide from my colleague Bridget Young about the, the, the pipeline, really. Um, and how the problems can occur from, the, from where patients are and your trial, all the different ways they can come into that and all the different ways that can fail and you can lose patients because you will lose patients throughout the process and you need to minimize that. 
And I think that to think about recruitment like you think about the intervention that you're trialing is useful. So recruitment is a complex intervention in a way. And you, as the MRC say, you need to understand that. You need to model it and you need to test it before you go live. And that's what we'll talk about here. How can you think about the recruitment process and how can you identify the core issues that are likely to cause you problems as you move forward? And an interesting kind of analogy here is, is one that was um, introduced to me by Sean Truick, who's one of the key researchers in this area from the University of Aberdeen. And he, I, he was um, reading about Chris Hoy, the cyclist, and his success. And one of the key things about Chris Hoy's success is it wasn't related to any one thing. His training, his preparation was entirely based on the idea that it's all about marginal gains. So they did things with just about every aspect of his lifestyle to get him into that Olympic position. So they looked at things like the, the, the how he slept, the pillow he slept on, all these sorts of issues. And Sean's view is it's the same with recruitment. There are no magic bullets. And the only way to deal with recruitment is to optimize the entire process such that patients flow in um, because all the parts are working together. And that's the only way to do it. We haven't found, you know, there's very little evidence about what works, and it's very unlikely that one thing will suddenly make a big change. So you need to think about the entirety of the process if you're going to make this work. So we're going to talk about three things um, briefly, design, test, and monitoring. So how can you design your trial to be best suited to, to um, good recruitment? Well, you need to think about the research process. You need to think about the intervention process. So the intervention itself, how much time, effort, and burden does it require from both patients and potentially from professionals? And how different is it to current practice? How much of a, an ask are you making? And how important is that? Sometimes it's good to have an intervention that doesn't add too much to current practice. Sometimes that makes it very unattractive. And you need to think about that and get some views on how that's going to affect things. And the research process, how much time, effort and burden, the appointments, the travel, the time, the literacy requirements, can you make your trial easier to do on patients? Can you ease the process? What sacrifices are you willing to make for your scientific cases to maximize recruitment? Because you can have a beautiful trial with um, great science and if you can't recruit, it's no good to anyone. You need to think about inclusion exclusion criteria. There was an interesting study here from uh, Sean's group looking at the inclusion and exclusion of patients in studies and in routine practice. And they looked at patients taking breast cancer treatment and they found that those patients who are taking the treatment in routine care a lot of those would not have got into the trials on which that was based. So that's both scientifically a bit ridiculous, but also suggested why were those inclusion criteria in place when actually when the treatment's being used, they're going to be used much more widely. So think about, do you need to be so tightly defined? And I think one of the in interesting issues here is how many times inclusion criteria get changed when recruitment problems happen. So often people define a population very clearly, very clear about what they want, and then six months, a year down the line, they've got no patients, and they suddenly start to drop those off. And actually, you know, that says something, I think, about what we are designing into these studies. We need to think very carefully. Don't just do what everyone else did in terms of exclusion, because if you're going to have to change it later, you might as well change that early. And think about preferences. So preferences for pa among patients and among professionals about what they want for the treatment. Um, this is a very um, famous um, study called the Protect RCT by Jenna Donny Donovan and her group. Um, and they found that um, you could, preferences are really important. Patients often have preferences but they think those preferences can be modified. But patients come in with ideas about treatment preferences and they can be challenged gently and sensitively. But sometimes you can say to patients, well, what's that based on? Why do you think treatment A is better than treatment B? And occasionally those patients will then realize, actually, there's not much difference in these treatments or I don't know why I'm choosing one over another and come into trial. So is that something that might be relevant for your trials? And can you train your people, your researchers and your clinical teams to take those issues into account, to, to gently challenge patient preferences? Obviously, patients have the right to stay out of a trial if they wish, but it's important that information is informed. So can, is that something you can challenge? Is that something that you can modify? And involve patients. Um, there is obviously a huge um, interest in patient and public involvement in research, and it's starting to have an impact on recruitment. This is a study from the British Journal of Psychiatry suggesting that recruitment 
um, in um, mental health is associated with um, patient, good patient and public involvement. We're just working out now how, how to do this, um, but it does suggest that good patient and public involvement early in studies is having an impact on recruitment. So important lesson for us all. The second issue is about testing. So the MRC framework says before you run a complex intervention, you need to test it. And it's the same with trials. Um, so there is a lot of interest in pilot feasibility studies. The NIHR in the UK has defined these two um, different types of trials around pilot feasibility, but they allow you to test assumptions you've made about the prevalence and incidence of conditions, uptake and conversion rates, and variations across site, setting, and time. And from our experience, uptake and conversion rates are often a key thing. You really don't know how many patients you ask who are eligible are going to come into your study. And if you get that wrong, if you think it's 20% and it turns out to be 10%, that makes a huge difference to all your calculations. So these are really, really important. So wherever possible, and especially with complex trials, you should be building those in where possible. Um, if you're doing one of these, you need to have clarity about stop-go criteria. You need to say to people, this is what I need to happen. Um, in a certain period to make the tri trial viable. And that's really about thinking about how would I scale this up? So if I can do recruit X number of patients in Y sites in Z months and retain that many at six months, that means I can scale up and run a two year trial across five times as many practices and make this thing work. But be aware of idiosyncratic pilot sites. The temptation is to use your colleagues or somebody you know to run a pilot study. And at the end of that, all you know is that it works in one site. So the temptation is to go for the easiest site in the pilot, but actually you're just storing up problems. So you need to be careful with site selection. And finally, monitoring. This graph, this is from um, Sean's group. This, if you're running trials, these will be the things that haunt your dreams um, day in, day out. The recruitment graph showing progress against expected numbers. So every trial should have one of these. They will be monitored. Each site will be monitored. And this will be the thing that keeps you awake at night. However, you need to link that to action. There's no point in just monitoring these things. What are you going to do with that information? And remember, it's difficult to do things quickly in trials. So you need to have a plan linked to that monitoring, which is, good, which is agreed with all the sites. So what are you going to do? You're going to introduce new strategies, change criteria, new sites, closing existing sites, and the really complicated one, shifting resources. So if you've got three or four sites and two are recruiting and two are not, are you going to close? Can you close those two sites and shift the resource to the sites that are working? Because there's always variation with insights and you need to have a plan. There's no point in just monitoring for the sake of monitoring. You'll need to do that. A funder will require you to do that, but you need to have a plan and you need to think it takes time to turn these things around. They are like super tankers. They do not navigate easily and you need to think well in advance about what is possible based on the data you're getting. The other thing you can do with monitoring is the more detailed monitoring that um, is possible. So again, Jenny Donovan's group in Bristol, they've done work around looking at the actual recruitment consultations that are taking place in trials and then feeding that back to trials very quickly in a way they can do something about. So the classic one was the PROTECT study, um, which was looking at um, prostate uh, testing for cancer. And what they found, there were three arms in that trial, one of which was watchful waiting, which was felt to be a relatively benign term by everyone except the patients who heard it. They heard watchful waiting, and in their minds, they thought that means no treatment, potentially just neglect. They're going to just watch me die. And of course, that had a major effect on recruitment, so they picked that up and then fed that back and were able to make changes on the basis of that, which, from the evidence that we've got, um, potentially had a, a reasonable impact on recruitment. So that's something you can do. It takes resource. It needs to be uh, planned well with ethics about what's possible. But if you can get information about what's actually going on in these consultations and feed that, share that good practice, that potentially allows you to make relatively rapid changes to what you're doing. So that's almost done. I'm going to let you get to your lunch quickly enough. But just to summarize, First, you're not alone. Everyone struggles with recruitment. Um, those who are look like they're flying with recruitment are almost certainly paddling extremely hard to get there. Um, and problems with recruitment, especially early stage problems, are 
absolutely prevalent. So you will, it's highly likely you will face this and don't ever assume because you've done it once and it's been successful, it will be the same. Things change, attitudes change, um, and sometimes logistical factors change. So just be careful that you don't make assumptions. We don't unfortunately know much about what works with recruitment. So we are essentially looking at best practice and looking to share best practice wherever possible. The, the scientific evidence is very limited. There's quite a lot of us who are, look, are trying to turn that around, trying to do things which will in, increase the scientific evidence, but that's not gonna happen quickly. There are ways of reducing risk, and partly that is about good planning, as we've said, testing and monitoring. So you need to have those systems in place to ensure that you get rapid feedback about what's working and what's not working um, so you can make changes um, because you need to think about these changes take time. Bringing new sites on can be a major, major problem. Um, so you need to be set up potentially to do that. And explore recruitment the same way you would treat the intervention. We spend ages looking in detail with process evaluations about how an intervention was perceived, how it was taken up, how it was adhered to. That's considered normal. We should do that with recruitment. It's as complicated and as important. And so I'd treat it the same way. And try and build in flexibility as your studies. We tend to do pragmatic trials in primary care where we try to restrict the inclusion exclusion criteria as much as possible and keep things flexible. But you need to build that in. The temptation is always to say that I'm going to do things much more quickly than you think is viable, um, but you're just storing up problems. So I would try and build in flexibility to the, the both the, 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 the bid itself in terms of timings wherever possible, but also the management of it. Allow yourself some, some room because you will need to make changes. That's me done. Thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to take questions if the technology works, but I hope that was just a useful introduction to the area. Uh, yes, you're uh, a little indistinct, so if you could try and speak as clearly as possible, that would be good. Well, people are hungry, but they're also hungry for knowledge and probably have some questions. Right. I see one eyes for back here. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. I just have a couple of points rather than questions. I think I'd just like to add. I think some things to take into consideration at the start of the protocol development process is to within the feasibility process that you're conducting really before your protocol is final when you're planning you're collecting your sites and when you send out the feasibility. You know, send it to as many sites as you're considering and to also take on board the feedback that you get from the investigators at the start. And uh -huh. that can be you know, very valuable. And if they're the sites you're considering and they're giving you feedback on your protocol at that point, they can easily be considered. And also to have a very comprehensive and experienced protocol development team at yep. the start that is constituted, you know, with the investigators, statisticians, data managers, project managers, um, and to have a good comprehensive team so that you're considering all the elements and that will add to the success of your of the study work too. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, you know, I you can't have too many people looking at the recruitment process. So I think you're absolutely right. Bigger teams and, and rapid feedback is is uh, massively useful um, through that. And you know it's it is, I mean, the, the experience is so shared in terms of difficulties of recruitment, you can always get advice from people who've done this sort of thing. So I think that's um, points well made. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Again. Um, I just want to say, following up on your point, one of the problems is you still get the monitoring of the recruitment rate. But that recruitment rate prediction is often absolutely arbitrary with starting point A with finishing point B and you just send the subjects and they score straight down between those points. Yeah. You also need to test and better modeling of patient recruitment. So we understand it's going to be slow to start. At this point you might start to see an increase, this point it will slow down again, so that it's a slow to start, but we know that next week and week later. We're not cancelling the trial too early. Yeah. So we expect a faster start. It, it should be the gap that is worrying us and not just some arbitrary difference we say for ourselves. 
No, I think that's well made. I mean, I, you're absolutely right about the straight line graph being a very poor representation of what goes on. And I think there's just these practical issues because what's, what's interesting, I think you're absolutely right, because we design our trials on this basis. And as soon as we've got the money, we start to think, well, we're not going to recruit in summer and it's going to die over Christmas and Easter's going to be really difficult. And you suddenly realize that there are, and with the investigator holidays and illness and all the rest of it. So I think you're absolutely right that, that the, the straight line graph and the straight um, sort of in, um, estimates we do are potentially quite poor. And I think we're very bad at building in these other factors outside of that, which can really, really slow things down. Um, and yes, you probably, I mean, I, you might argue we probably have about a 10 month recruitment time in a 12 month period um, when sites will be active and patient populations will be available. So I think that's a very, very good point. Yeah, Peter, um, Linda Yearwood asked, uh, patients with schizophrenia for genetic studies, one of my best recruiters used to bring on a, a large bag of packets of cigarettes and as more than 5% of people with schizophrenia smoke, uh, they didn't want to participate and got rid of them one packet of cigarettes and then the facility wanted to do two packets of cigarettes. Right. So the um, I suppose my question is, does issue to do and pressure on recruitment that influence and ethics and the ethics of the context in general? So I think, yes, I think that's a really interesting issue because um, we, when I, I, I did the peer review for Jenny Donovan's work, when she, when she was saying about potentially challenging patients' preferences, and what I think was interesting was, of course, they, they challenged patients who had preferences and weren't, weren't going to come into the trial, but patients who didn't have a preference, that was never discussed because they're coming into the trial, so we don't really mind, and those patients may just be equally poorly informed as those who had preferences but were on the wrong basis. So I think you're absolutely right. There is pressure um, to recruit. Um, I've got to say, in my experience, I think it, it, we haven't got into that stage net now where we are putting patients under significant pressure. I think ethics does a very good job of, of, of buffering patients from that and making it clear that um, there are limits to what can be done. So I don't think, I think that it, there's definitely a tension. Uh, I think that's a broad attention really about how how keen we should be get, to get pa patients into trials because we have a slightly uh, ambivalent attitude to trials. We've, you know, in the UK, in England, we have this OK to Ask campaign. Lots of lots of stuff about saying how good trials are and how important they are and people should take part. And on the other hand, most of the documentation makes it clear that you, you don't have to take part and there's no pressure at all. So I, I think you're absolutely right. There is a pressure there. I don't see it in my normal work that patients are being pressured into trials. I've got to say, I don't see a lot of that. Um, but you could argue that the pressure to recruit um, is, I think one of the, it's less in terms of the coercion around individual patients. I think partly it's about how we do our trials. So in primary care, where we do the bulk of our trials, I think we've got very used to spreading our net very wide. We know recruitment is going to be problematic. So we send out invites to tens of thousands of patients to get hundreds. And I think what we're doing is, is, is taking a very scattershot approach to recruitment now because we're so worried about it. Um, which I think has real implications for the external validity of what we do. So it's, I'm not sure it's coercion so much. I think that's something we need to be always on guard for. I think it's slightly more around the temptation is to accept very, very low consent rates in trials so that you might only get 5 or 2% of patients taking part. And scientifically, that's really problematic. And the focus on the recruitment graph and recruitment around numbers, I think, is, is led us to kind of ignore that a little, a little bit and pay insufficient attention. So I think we need to be on guard for ethics. It's not something I've noticed massively, um, but I think there are other broader effects that the recruitment crisis, if you like, has on us as scientists, which, again, we need to consider. Thank you. Uh, any final questions? And if you we move to lunch and just to thank you very much, uh, Professor Borough, for joining us. Um, My pleasure. Uh,